All right, we're going to dig into the next lecture in analytics for business and economics. We're going to talk about the chi-squared test of independence. And what's really important to note about the chi-squared test is it's, it's a little bit of a Swiss army knife of statistical tests. There's a number of different things that we can do with it depending on how we feed the data into the test. And that gives us a number of different interpretations that we can do given how, depending on how we feed the data into the test. And so we've already done one where we had one categorical variable and that was a goodness of fit test. In other words, does the data that we observe match the kind of distribution of the data that we would expect to see? Um, in this lecture, we're going to talk a little bit about the test of independence, and that's where we're actually going to compare a set of two categorical variables and looking at, okay, are these categories independent of one another, or is there a dependency there that we can see in the data? So without any further ado, let's jump right in. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about test of independence, and we're going to do this one just a little bit differently. You can see I still have my same basic setup. I have the lecture notes on the left-hand side and RStudio on the right-hand side. But before we get too far into it, what I want to do is I want to go through, first of all, kind of a little bit of the, the, the mathematics behind, the mechanics behind the chi-squared test of independence. And then when we get done with that, I'm actually going to go through a full case study where we look at doing some analysis with maybe some a little more real-worldly looking kind of data. Okay, so let's stick right in. Um, looking at a chi-squared test of independence, first of all, what is it? Well, the chi-squared test of independence is a statistical test used to determine whether two categorical variables are independent or related. This test is often used when we're doing some kind of contingency table. All right, so, and what I mean by a contingency table or a cross tabulation is, okay, I have two categories, two sets of categories, and I wanna count within those two sets of categories. So we're going to do an example down here when we get to the case study, we're gonna look at some data that a bank has collected. And this bank wants to know, all right, do they have a home loan or not based on um, some kind of categorical analysis of their job type? All right, so we have various job types and we want to look at, okay, does that job type impact whether or not they have a home loan or not? Well, why might this be interesting? Well, this would be interesting for a bank because you know, basically if I know their um, occupation and say they're an occupation that tends to have, be, be, have mostly are, have home loans, but I have someone in the occupation who doesn't, maybe they're a good person to market to or maybe this person's not a good person to market to because we know a lot of people in that occupation don't have home loans. Who knows, right? Um, we'll, we'll see how that works out and whether or not there is any dependence between those two categories when we get there. But for right now, let's, let's just do the overview. And so let's keep going. Basic mechanics. This is the same chi-squared test statistic. Now I've written out the... Um, Notation here, just a little differently, instead of putting observed and expected, I'm using O and E, and I've got an I and a J in there. Well, what's going on with there? Well, I need to keep track of whether or not it's going to come from category or the set of categories number one or the set of categories number two. We're going to think of these as instead of a vector, all right, just a list, but a two-dimensional list, so a matrix, right, where you know, the rows will be one set of categories, the columns will be another set of categories. And so that's, well, that's what we're doing here. And that's why I'm changing this notation just a little bit. And so we just have a little bit bigger sum to do. It's just, you're gonna take the, the element by element for each one of those elements in, the, in your um, uh, ob observed, and this is actually a matrix, so it's a two dimensional list and minus the expected, square that, divide that, and sum them all up. So basically it's the same basic statistic, it's just just a teeny bit more complicated because we added another dimension. On top of that, this expected value that we have here is a little more complicated and yeah, we can we have the, the definitions of the OIJ and the EIJ, and then we can come down here and get our EIJ, it's calculated like this, where we take counts of each one and we divide that out and you know i'm gonna let you read about that you can look at it it's fine our degrees of freedom calculation is a little more complicated because it's number of 
rows minus one times number of columns minus one because we have more things that we can we can talk about we're talking about a matrix and that has an area instead of just a, a single list of numbers and so i'm going to skip that a little bit in favor of just diving headlong into well how do we use it and how do we interpret it okay the first thing i want to show you is i find it very easy to represent our observed data as a matrix Okay, and that matrix is going to be, um, we'll put one category in the rows, another category in each of the columns. So how do I do this? Let's look at this matrix function. It's a little bit funky, um, and I'm not gonna show you an exact example of it just yet. Um, I just wanted to show you how this, this goes together, and then in the case study, we'll kind of do it all together. We do matrix, and what it's gonna do is it says, um, 10, 20, 30, 40. So it just gives me a list of numbers. And then I tell it it has two rows. Okay, and so what it wants to do then is it's going to, okay, I have two rows. I'm going to fill up columns. I've got four things here. So if I want to get two rows, that means, oh, I'm going to have two columns. And I, have it, I haven't said anything otherwise. It's going to fill in the columns first. So it's going to go 10, 20. And then it's going to go to the next column, 30, 40. And so essentially what it's going to do is it's going to go 10, 20. Oh, there's two rows. Go to the next number, the next column, 30, 40. Go to the next column, so on and so on and so forth until it runs out of numbers. And it'll just fill in numbers if it um, doesn't have the right enough numbers to make, a, to make the correct matrix, to make a full rectangular matrix. But we don't have to worry about that right now. Here's the thing. Here's how to do this. Put your data in just like this. Tell it the number of rows. Let it plot and, and make sure you output the matrix. Look at the matrix and make sure it makes sense. So here in um, for category, you know, one, I got 10 and 30 for um, for the first part and for the uh, for the second part, 20 and 40. All right, it's contingency, right? So all those that are in category one, that are one in category set one and one in category set two, there's 10 of those, all right, so on and so forth. It doesn't really make sense now because it's, well, it's all arbitrary and I haven't given you any examples. Don't worry, I'm going to, just just um, hold on a second. So put a pin in that. We then just feed that matrix right into the chi-squared test and the chi-squared test gives us our results, okay? And so it tells us our degrees of freedom, our chi-squared test, and our p-value, our p-value here is huge. So what do we do? We're going to we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis and find that um, what is our null hypothesis? Let's remember um, uh, the chi square test. The independence is calculated, uh, but considers both variables in their interactions. Oh, where is this? Determine whether variables are independent or not. interpret our results here. The results of the chi-squared test of independence gives a chi-squared test statistic and p-value. A large chi-squared statistic and a small p-value, all right, those two go hand in hand, indicate that the data provided strong evidence against the null hypothesis of, of independence. See there, you can see I had some trouble there explaining all of this because I failed to do my first rule. I didn't state my hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that the two things are independent. Um, we lack evidence to conclude otherwise. So since the p-value is big in this case, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. In this, case, in this one, if our p-value is less than our common, you would reject the null hypothesis and the variables are independent. But guess what? It's really big, so we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Maybe in our case study, when we do this um, as an example, um, we won't, we will reject our null hypothesis. Who knows? All right. There's also another way you can look at this. They're called a mosaic plot. So in this case, we're going to load the VDC function or package. All right. Because it has a nice function called mosaic plot. 
And all it does is basically do this kind of stacked bar chart type thing close together. So we can look and get an idea, you know, how these things look together. So column one looks at the distribution between for if it is um, column one, right? Basically, it's just visualizing that contingency plot that we had up before. Um, we can say a few things about this in a mosaic plot. The size of each rectangle corresponds to the cell frequency. So larger rectangles, larger counts, rectangles split the variables given along the distribution of one variable conditional on the other. So we can see, all right, the area of this upper left-hand one has to do with how many um, units are both one for category two and one for category set one, right? I know this doesn't make sense because I don't have um, a concrete example here. I will in a minute, I promise. Okay, let's keep going. Um, the rectangles are split, oh yeah, in, in the example plot, the width of the rectangle represents the distribution of the first variable and the height represents the distribution of the second variable, which on the first. All right, this may help you visualize. To be honest, it doesn't help me a whole lot visualize what's going on. So. For the most part, I don't use these very much. I like to look at the, the, the contingency table or, or the cross tabulation, and I like to look at the actual test statistic. Okay, so let's dig in and actually make this make some sense with a real world example. So I'm gonna resume my RStudio. I'm gonna shrink this down a little bit. And we'll talk about our case study. So while that's loading, I'll get started. Um, the case study is about conducting a chi-squared test statistic of independence. All right, we have a set of direct marketing campaign data from a Portuguese banking institution. Um, you can get the data set. You can download this data set yourself right here This by clicking that link if you want to. Um, and I'll also show you how to do that in our code here in just a second. All right, so the contents. The bank's marketing team is interested whether a client's job, in this case, the name of that variable in the data set is called job, is associated with the person having a housing loan or housing. We're going to use a chi-squared test statistic to look at this. Okay, and so let's get a quick description of our data. We have a whole bunch of data in this da bank data set, but we're going to look at the job, which is the type of job that they have. And here you can see a list of the types of jobs that we have in um, that data set. Um, finally, we're housing. It's a yes, no, whether or not they have a housing loan or not. Okay, so let me come over here. Oh, I got a bunch of crap in here. Let's get rid of all this for right now. That was from the previous lecture. Get rid of all that. And let's start out, we're going to load our data. All right, this is the first time I'm having you load data from a remote source. So, Let's have a look at this. We're going to use the read.csv file because this data is at this website and we can see at the end it's a CSV. So let me make this a little bit. There we go. Now you can read the whole thing. It's .csv. So we need this read.csv file. So let's come right in here and we've got a couple of things to note about it. It's not really a comma separated values um, file. It's a semicolon separated values function or value um, um, uh, file. So first of all, we put this in here. That's just a, a, a the URL or where that is on the web to where you can get this actual file. If you click this, it's going to let you download the file. All right, if you put that in your browser, it'll take you to it and let you download it or it might just show it to you and you have to save it. All right, the next thing is we want to tell R that instead of using a comma to separate all of the columns, it's using a semicolon. I don't know why, it's weird. That's the way it is. Actually, it makes some sense to use a semicolon because in Europe, they flip-flop the um, decimal point and the, the comma. So they use commas for decimal points. And so that can cause some problems when you're reading in data. And so let's go ahead and before we go any farther, let's see what this looks like. So I'm gonna type in head, all right? And that's just gonna give me the first few rows of this data because I'm reading this in using read.csv. We talked about that um, in an earlier lecture. 
and I'm going to store this in a variable named bank. And so now I want to see the first few rows of bank. Let's run that. Bang, and there's the first few rows, and we can see there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. We're not going to use all of it. We are just going to use job and housing. All right, that's yes, no, whether they have a house loan or not. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we need to come down here, and we're going to make a table. All right, and all right, let's let's talk just a little bit here. I've got I've got a little complication there that we don't need. That's in the lecture. That if you want to, you can play with it, but we really don't need it right this second. Okay, so I'm gonna paste this in for a minute, and we'll talk about what we're doing. So we're gonna check the distribution, job and housing, by making these variables. First of all, I'm gonna use the table function. And that I'm going to do a cross reference or a cross tabulation. All right, it's going to say, okay, all the admins, how many no's are there? How many yeses are there? All the blue collar, how many um, no's and how many yeses to housing? So it's going to have basically, because I put jobs first, it's going to have those as the rows and housing a second, it's going to have the two outputs for housing as columns. And then let's talk about this. This thing right here is called the pop up pipe operator. Um, not to be confused with the pipe character, which is, you know, in R, that's what we use for or, which is that guy. It's the pipe operator. It comes from a package called dplyr, which is a part of the tidyverse. Um, and so what it does is it says it takes whatever's over here and makes it the first argument of this function on the, the, the other side of it, on the right-hand side of it. All right, and this function on the right-hand side of it is just to make this this table look a little prettier. We're not going to worry about that, so we're just going to delete all that for now. All right, all that was doing was just making your output a little prettier. But let's pull this in, bing, there we go. And this is perfectly, this is perfectly fine. It's the exact same thing as we've got over here. It's just not quite as pretty. But in any event, here we are. So that's the first thing. We have our contingency table. Let's let's come down here. Oh, good. Hey, I, I learned my lesson from before, and I stated my hypothesis. Null hypothesis. Job and housing variables are independent of one another. There's no relationship between the two. You know, the fact that you have a particular job type doesn't tell me anything about whether or not you're going to have a housing loan or not. All right. That's 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 basically the question that we're. Kind of question we're having. and vice versa. Whether or not you have a housing loan doesn't really tell me very much about whether or not what what job type you have. Um, we're going to test whether or not that's true or not. The alternative is job and housing are dependent upon one another. There's a relationship between the two, and that's all it means by dependence. There's a relationship between the two. Okay, and so well, let's let's take a look at that. How are we going to do this? First of all, we need to take this table function. And we're going to store it. So we're going to use this right over here where it says cross tab. So cross tabulation. I don't know. Cross dot tab to cross tabulate between um, admin and housing. If you're used to Excel, this is a little like what a pivot table can do. Um, L -E -P, so table. And then we're going to do um, bank dollar sign job comma bank dollar sign housing. All right, and then we're going to save that. Bingo, that's cross tab. And, that, and cross tab is just, here, I'll, I, I highlighted that, and now I'm going to press command enter to run just the highlighted part little trick um, and you can see it's exactly the same as what we calculated up there you know, no big surprise there nothing 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 fancy going on next thing we're going to do is we're going to feed this table into our chi-squared test statistic our chi-squared test all right so we'll do c h i s q dot stat and we'll store in that c h i sq chi squared dot test and we'll give it cross tab 
Okay, and then finally, we will print it out. I'm going to show you a quick trick. If I put this whole thing in parentheses, it'll also print out. I don't really like doing it this way very much because sometimes your parentheses get out of hand. But for right now, that'll work. Bing, and there is our output, which is okay. That that's what we expected. All right, so we have 11 degrees of freedom. Let's let's look at this. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12 rows, so 12 minus 1 is 11, times 2 columns, 2 minus 1, or 2 minus 1 is 1, so 11 times 1 is 11 degrees of freedom. Okay, great. And I have a p-value of less than 2.2 e negative 16. So let's, let's take a quick reminder of what that means. Okay, so that E is not referring to like Euler's constant or anything. It actually refers to 10 to the. So this number should be read as 10 or as 2.2 .2 times 10 raised to the negative 16. In other words, we have 0. Point 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and then 2, 2. It's less than that number. That number is pretty darn small, or PDS, which means we're definitely less than 0 0.05, and so we reject the null hypothesis. We have strong evidence to reject the whole hypothesis of independence and conclude, nope, there is a relationship between the two. How, whether or not you have a housing loan is dependent upon um, or, or the type of job and vice versa. We know there's a dependence there. Um, now, that's all we know. We know there's a relationship. We don't know how it works. We don't know how much it is. We don't know how strong it is at this point. All we know is that there is a relationship there. And there you go. We have done a complete job from beginning to end where we created our cross tabulation and so on and so forth. One thing I do want to show you, I'm going to show you one more time because in your cases that are coming up, you're going to be just given a data set, all right, to, to type in. And, you know, the data set that's, you know, this um, data set has, I don't know how many thousands of observations in it. Um, let's look and see. Um, has 45,211 observations of 17 variables. Obviously, I don't want you to type all that in. Um, you're going to get the contingency table. So you'd get a table like this. Probably not this complicated, but similar to this. How would I have you do that? Well, let's say we only have the first three rows. So it's this one, just these first few numbers. I want to show you how we would do that kind of manually. All right, so I'm going to come right here so that I can have the, my chunk close to my data so I can see what I'm doing. But let's say we just had these first three rows provided to us, and that's what we were supposed to do the chi-squared independence test on. Right? How could we do that? Well, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use the matrix function. Okay. The next thing I'm going to do is, okay, I have this number. So I'm just going to type in my numbers. Either go by rows or go by columns. Doesn't matter which. Just pick one and do it. I'm going to go by rows. All right. So it's going to be 1989, comma, 3182, comma, 2684, comma, 70, 48, comma, 618, comma, 869. All right, those are my numbers. But wait a minute, I did that wrong. I need to use the combine function to make those numbers a vector. All right, so I'm going to put those all inside a combine function. And then that's going to go in my matrix. And then I need to add some more stuff to my matrix function. I can either tell it the number of rows or the number of columns. Doesn't matter which. I'll tell it the number of columns because it's easier to count. There's two, there's three rows, but that's fine. 
Then the next thing I want to do is I need to tell it, do I want to go by row or by column? If I want to go by column, I would put by row equal to false. If I want to go by um, row, I'm going to put it equal to true. How do you know which to do? Here's the thing. It's a 50-50 chance. Just write it out, put it in, and then run your code real quick. Does it come out the way you wanted it to? 19, 32, ba ba. All right, yeah, this matrix matches up to this one. No problem. That's what I wanted. All right, what if I did it wrong? What if I made it false? Okay, or omitted it or something like that. Let's go ahead. We'll run that. And look, all right, by row, false. I end up with 1989, um, 7048. Wait a minute, 1989 is here, 7048 is here. That's not the way I want it, right? So that's not right. So obviously, I want this to be true. Okay, and is it true or false? It depends on how you enter this data. So I entered it by row, so I want by row to be true. If you decided to enter it by column, you'd make by row equal false. And then you just run it and test it, make sure it's right. If it is, then you did it right. If it's not, well, then change it. Now, this matrix, all right, if I had to put all of the data in, I could feed that into chi-square, chi-square.test, and I'll get the exact same results. All right, easy peasy. So there we go. There is my test of independence and a quick example of how to do it.